Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. As we prepare our hearts for the table of the Lord tonight, it's sort of fitting (coughs) that uh, here on Resurrection Sunday in the evening that we have the table of the Lord, we break bread. It was on an evening service that the Lord showed up. It's always a worthy study when we take time to examine the sayings of Christ on the cross, and there were seven of them. We're going to look at them tonight. They break into four compartments, and um, each compartment begins with the letter C. Each individual item in each compartment begins with the letter P. So, just a little alliteration to help us. So we're in Luke chapter 23. And we'll begin with prayer. Our loving Father, help us by faith to see once again our lovely Jesus. The darkest day in all of Earth's history was Good Friday. The brightest day, I suppose, is Resurrection Sunday. Lord, please help us to love Jesus more. Father, we spoke of the little sins, and boy, it's... It's so true. Father, those little sins are often what gets in and spoils relationships. Mainly our relationship with you. Our Heavenly Father, help us to love Jesus more tonight. And help us to find that as we love him more, we, we love the world less. We don't care so much for the world. Now the people of the world... It breaks our hearts and we cry for them and for their salvation. But the ways of the world. Lord, may we leave them behind as if they're Sodom and Gomorrah. Help us, Lord, to be pure like Jesus is pure and holy like he is holy. Happy as he is happy. Our Father, bless us tonight and prepare our hearts for the table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our first main compartment is called compassion. Compassion, did you know that even on the cross, our Lord was compassionate? Very true. Uh, That's a lesson for us, that even though we may be going through some tough times, uh, let's be compassionate for those around us. You say, I can't. When I get going tough times, boy, I'm just all out of sorts and everything. Well, God can fix that, and God can forgive you and fix that up. But uh, you and I need to be like Christ. Remember that that's what we are. In this world, we're like little Christs, if you will. We are pretty much the only Jesus the world is ever going to see. They have to see Jesus in us. So here we have uh, our first word, (coughs) and that's the word pardon. We find in Luke 23 and verse 34, Then said Jesus, in fact, read, read this verse out loud with me, please, would you? Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you can stop there. It goes on to say how they parted his raiment and cast lots. Imagine that. They set up a, they set up a, a, a lotto. <laughs> they set up a gambling joint at the foot of the cross. Because uh, he did have a nice, a nice garment, a nice coat. Said, well, it's too nice to tear it in pieces. Uh, Let's gamble it off. And so that's what they did. Set up a little casino there at the foot of the cross. Said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We may not fully understand the impact of Jesus' words, but uh, I believe it was necessary that he prayed that. If he had not prayed that, I think uh, thunder would have sounded, lightning would have struck. Judgment would have fallen upon all the perpetrators. Possibly also particularly on the Jewish people. Remember, they said to Pilate, let his blood be upon us. And um, certainly that's a a bad thing to wish for when you're talking about the blood 
of the Son of God. You know, who wants to be guilty of the death of Christ, right? Did you know that in the communion service, if you're not uh, right with God, and particularly, particularly if you're not saved, if you're not born again, that's exactly what you're doing. You're inviting the, the judgment upon yourself for the blood of Christ for his death. We'll look at that briefly later. But here, the Lord Jesus needed to pray this. Uh, Father, forgive them. It wasn't um, just some sort of uh, warm, fuzzy feelings. It was an important prayer. By the way, when people do you wrong, what do you do? Do you go to God and say, Father, forgive them? Or do you grumble? Remember the little sins. I don't know how little that one is, but uh, when people do you wrong, uh, people do me wrong too, you know. Um, And I suppose I do people wrong. It's a human kind of thing, but what do we do about it? And I think that we need to go to God and we need to ask God to forgive him. I think that that would be the Christ-like thing to do. Soon after they hung Jesus on the cross. Now this is before perhaps any numbness of the pain had set in. He prayed to the Father to forgive those responsible for his death. The soldiers, as we pointed out, were gambling for his clothes And Jesus showed divine forgiveness. Even at the height of his suffering, he was willing and able to forgive even those that shamefully wronged him. This is all part of compassion. And the second P under compassion is paradise. In uh, the same chapter, uh, we find that there was uh, a couple of male factors. And they were hanged on the cross in verse 39. But finally in verse... um, 42, one of them repents and says unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Please read out verse 43 out loud with me. And Jesus said unto him, verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So here's the second P, it's paradise. The first P is is pardon. The second is paradise. And of course, it had to do with the thief. This man lived his life for money. A lot of people do that. That's what thieves do, right? They want the money. And so that's why they go into the thievery business and they steal. A lot of people today are in the thievery business, only it's a legitimate kind of thievery business. And they put fine print on their documents, hoping you never read it. And then they cash in on you. Now, uh, Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, the, the one thief had jeered at Jesus much the same way that the crowd had. So, you're the Messiah, are you? Well, prove it by saving yourself and save us too while you're at it. And the other criminal protested and turned to the Lord Jesus and said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And uh, he repented on the cross. He got saved. Say, how do you know he got saved? Because of what Jesus said today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Lost people don't go to paradise. Lost people don't go to heaven. Lost people go to hell. Jesus promised them on that very day that they would be together in paradise. Now, this exchange took place before they'd been on the cross for very long. It didn't take much time for this to happen. And Jesus offered the thief who repented in his last hours the assurance of immortality. Well, we come to the third P under the first container of compassion. And for this, we'll need to go back to the, over to the Gospel of John And chapter 19, we're trying to do these in order. John chapter 19. Now, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, along with the two malefactors, there was quite a bit of... uh, uh, Curiosity seekers and thrill seekers that came out to, to witness this. And um, after the, uh, the first thrill of watching the crosses being raised up in the excitement and the jeering and the mocking, after that was over, the crowds began to thin out a little bit and people went back to their, their daily uh, routine. But standing close by Jesus was his mother. And if you look, please, at chapter 19 and verse 26. Let's see here. What have we got? 
When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that's the uh, Apostle John, he saith unto his mother, read those words out loud with me, please. Woman, behold thy son. And uh, if you look, please, at uh, verse 27, then saith he to the disciple, read those words, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And so there, uh, standing very close, was his mother, Mary. And there was a couple of other Marys. There were three Marys altogether. And so um, standing there also was the Apostle John. Uh, And even in his agony on the cross, he was concerned for the welfare of his mother. I think that uh, young men ought to watch out for their mothers. What do you think? Is that not a, a good thing to do? You know, it, uh, it irks me a little bit when I see young men who don't watch out for their mothers. They don't open the doors for them. They don't offer to carry things for them. They don't go out of their way. You know, they wouldn't set down their game controller, you know, for a moment to help out their mother. Um, take a lesson here, men, young men. <laughs> And if your mother is still alive, take a lesson here. Let's look after mom. Very important. If you're going to mistreat your mom or neglect your mom, don't let me see it. You know, that boy, that irks me. You know, when I see uh, moms being, being passed by, being just kind of left to stagger under the weight of something while their able-bodied son, you know, just goes right on his way. And here our Lord Jesus made provision, provision for his mother. So under, under a compassion, we have pardon and we have paradise and we have provision. Now we move to the next compartment, the next drawer, if you will. And in it, we find commission. Now here, let's go over to Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew and uh, to chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Now under commission, it was Christ's commission as he came into the world and what the father charged him to do. And the, uh, the fourth word beginning with P is payment. He made a payment here for the world. Now in chapter 27... Verse 46 is got to be one of the loneliest verses in the Bible. I'd like you to read that verse out loud with me, please. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So this happened about noon. So that's the sixth hour, darkness settled over all the land. So why is that? Well, we speculate, but probably the Heavenly Father just didn't want the world gaping upon his son at that time. It was a a very, it was the, the critical point where Jesus was literally suffering my hell and your hell. The Bible says that he was made sin for us. And I think that was when it happened, right there. And the Bible says in Mark 15 that darkness settled in over the the whole land. So this was the time that Jesus was experiencing separation from God. Now that's what people experience in hell, separation from God. And I know there are unsaved people who say, well, that suits me fine. I don't like God. He doesn't like me. I'll just be happy in hell. No, they won't. Because to be separated from God is to be separated from everything good. All of the good blessings and things that unsaved people take for granted here in this world, they'll, they'll be separated from. They'll, they'll still have their lusts and their thirsts and their desires, and they'll go crazy, they'll go mad. Uh, on the cross, many uh, criminals would, would go insane, uh, screaming, crying, uh, in hell, it's no different. It's worse, in fact. 
when all of the good things are removed, because when you remove God out of a situation, you remove the good things. They booted God out of the school system. Remember, we talked about this uh, back in the 60s in the United States. And of course, they began to reap the suffering uh, for it. Uh, The number of school shootings just escalated uh, from the 60s onward. And now it's like, okay, it's a new day. You know, tomorrow morning, we're going to get up and we're going to look at the news and we're going to wonder, well, you know, what school, what school is next? What, what young students have lost their lives? Uh, what, what new uh, mall or theater or stadium has been bombed? You know, what, what craziness is happening today? That's what happens when God is removed from the picture. Very important that we, we always make sure that Christ is the center of our homes. There's so many uh, Christians that um, come to church, they look good, they know how to sing the hymns, and they know how to sit up straight in church, but Christ seems eerily missing in their homes. And uh, you know that because, uh, number one, of course, there's no devotions, no devotions. Uh, any kind of prayer, if there is prayer, any kind of prayer at the table, it's just very fast, and it's just like what the Pharisees would do. They would just kind of babble a few words that really almost are meaningless, and then they dive in on their food, almost like animals. And so in homes in which uh, Christ is not really the head of the home, that's sad, because you're missing out on the blessings of Christ, the protection of Christ, the joy of Christ. And all of the other things that he he gives. Now Jesus on the cross was separated from God. Understand this. For the first time in all eternity. This had never, ever, ever happened before. Never. Even when he left heaven to be born into this world. he, He and the father were still together. They still had constant communion and fellowship. But there on the cross. This was the worst nightmare. And there he suffered and cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, he knew why, but this was in fulfillment to scripture back in the Psalms. Psalm 22, we have that. That's a prophecy. And so this was all part of the payment that Christ made for you and for me. He experienced utter hopelessness as sinners do in hell. And after three hours uh, on the cross, He turned to God in prayer and he used the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God. Well, we've looked at compassion. We've looked at commission. Now we move on to completion. And for this, we go back to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. His uh, main work is now completed. His uh, commission to come. uh, The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. For this reason am I come into the world. And uh, his prophecies about being crucified. uh, It's now done. And so we have completion. And our fifth word beginning with the letter P is parched. Parched. And that's for himself. The first, if you'll remember, was pardon. And that was for the crowd of cutthroats. The second was paradise for the thief. The third was provision for his mother. The fourth was payment for the world. The fifth is parched for himself. John chapter 19 and verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, read it out loud with me, I thirst. So it would seem that in doing that, he was asking for something to drink, something to wet his parched mouth. Say, why would he have a parched mouth? Well, it might have something to do with being forsaken of God. Luke chapter uh, 16, the rich man in hell, his first cry was for something to drink. He was parched. There on the cross, Jesus suffered your hell. He suffered my hell. He dipped his soul into what we deserve. And 
all what's involved, we may never know the depths of it. But he says now that he's thirsty. He wanted his last words to be heard, and he knew his job was finished, and so you know what they gave him to drink? They took a sponge and they filled it with what? Vinegar, right. That's what they offered to his mouth. And um, that being done, we now have the sixth word, and that's perfection. Perfection. And so we come to verse 30. I'd like you to read the whole verse out loud with me, would you please? When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So after his mouth was moistened, his thirst was somehow quenched a bit. He cried with this loud voice, indicating that the work he had come to accomplish was done. Everything was done. A completed salvation. All done. Perfect in every way. You can't add to it. You can't say, well, Lord, uh, thank you for what you did. Now I need to do my part. A group that calls themselves the Church of Christ teaches that you need faith in Jesus and you need to be fully baptized by immersion in order to be saved. Whoa. Baptism has its place, but not for salvation. Very important. Baptism shows the world what happened on the inside. The thief on the cross was promised paradise, heaven, never baptized, never baptized. Baptism is not an essential to salvation. There is no work that you can do. If you're going to add baptism, then why don't you add communion to it? That's certainly what the Catholics do. They say, well, you want to get to purgatory? No, no, I want to get to heaven. Forget heaven. The best you can do, buddy, is purgatory. Oh, yeah, you want to get to purgatory? Well, not really. Then you want to go to hell? No, no, okay, I'll go to purgatory. Okay, well, you have to take the mass over and over. You've got to say Hail Marys, and uh, you've got to be baptized. Of course, for them, that's just pouring a little water on your head, right? They don't really baptize, pretend baptism. And so well, why don't we add uh, uh, giving offerings? Why don't we add um, self-flagellation where you take a whip and you beat yourself till the blood flows? You know, where are we going to stop with the works of man? And so Jesus perfected salvation and he said, it is finished. Or as they say in Italian, finissimo. It's over. It's done. You cannot add to it. Oh, look, there's the Mona Lisa. It's a good thing I brought along my crayons so that I can finish it. Oh, look, there's the the, the portrait, the Last Supper. Boy, it's a good thing I brought along my can of spray paint so that I can fill in some of the, the missing flakes of paint. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't get within 10 feet of one of these with with, uh, a crayon or a can of spray paint. They'd kill you. They'd shoot you and then question you afterwards. (laughs) They're pretty serious when it comes to their works of art. Don't you dare touch our works of art, says the world. And God says, don't you dare touch my salvation. It cost me everything, everything, everything to purchase. Don't you think you can add to it? You know, that's important. Because when we come to God, sometimes we think we can get our prayers answered because, hey, you know, we've lived a pretty good life lately, haven't sinned too much lately. We are, at the best of times, yet undone. We need his grace and his mercy. Wow, when he said it is finished, did he, do you think he really meant it? Do you think he was in his right mind? You know, some people aren't in their right mind, you know that. And they might think something is finished and it hasn't even been half done. But when Jesus died for you and for me on the cross, and he said, it is finished, can we believe him? Yes or no? Yes. There's nothing more we can add to it. So salvation is either a receive it or reject it kind of offer. You receive what Christ has done, or you reject what Christ has done. Right? 
Listen, I'll tell you something. All roads don't lead to Rome. How do you know? Get on King George and see if it, you end up in Rome. Huh? All roads don't lead to Rome. All religions don't lead to God. There's so many uh, popular um, isms and so on. They say, well, it's all, we're all just one, you know. God is just one, and we are just like little droplets seeking to find our way to that great ocean of love. What kind of hog jowl is that? Truth is, we're separated. Man is not inherently good. He's a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If Jesus had not have died on the cross, there'd be nothing for you and for me. His whole commission, his purpose in life was to come and provide salvation for us. And he did it by himself. Thank you very much. He didn't need your help and my help. He provided a full salvation and it's free. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't go to church enough times. You don't get baptized, take communion, all these things in order to get it. No, you receive it like a gift or you reject it like something worthless. One or the other. But salvation has been perfected. We come now to the final, the fourth and final compartment. And that's the compartment entitled committal. Committal. We have our last word here. For this, we'll need to turn back to Luke chapter 23. Luke and chapter 23. The last word is peace. Peace. And peace for himself. I'd like you to read verse 46 out loud with me. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Let's read together. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus prayed and basically dismissed his spirit. You understand that you are... A soul inside of a, <coughs> I'm sorry, that must have looked strange when I said that. You are a soul inside of a body and you happen to have a spirit. Your spirit is not your soul. Your soul is not your spirit. They're not one and the same. They are two distinct personalities. You are the soul. You're thinking, you're feeling, you're reasoning, your emotions, you know, all that. That's you. You happen to be inside a body and you've got this thing called a spirit and praise the Lord for it because the spirit is given to you at conception. It's the spirit that gets things going and makes the body grow and keeps the heart beating. And it's somehow to do with the blood as well. It's in the blood somehow. We'll, we'll learn the technical details in heaven, but we've been given a spirit and you'll see in the Bible when people die, they give up the ghost. Ghost and spirit are two different words that refer to the same entity. Say, why do they use two words? I think it's because the word spirit refers to who it is. The word ghost refers to what he does. That's my thought on it from my study. And so it's one and the same entity. So there's, there's you, a soul inside of your body. Okay? But you need the spirit in order to animate the body. No spirit, no animation. When you die physically, that spirit leaves. It's dismissed. It's called home to heaven, according to Ecclesiastes, anyhow. And your soul then, and I have my thoughts about that, but I do know that for lost people, they end up in hell. For saved people, they end up in heaven. In 1 Corinthians, it promises us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so that's important for us to know. Now, Jesus was in total control. And when he finished his work on the cross, and he said, I thirst, and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he dismissed that spirit. It's as if he said, Spirit, I'm sure the spirit has a name, we don't know what it is. Uh, spirit, thank you for these 33 and a half faithful years you've, you've given me. I appreciate everything you've done. 
our work is now done in this body. You may go back to the Father. He dismisses his spirit. He gives up the ghost and he dies. Interestingly, people who are very familiar with dying people, they, they say that when someone comes to die, they normally always lift up their head to get that last breath in. It's a very normal, it's like a knee-jerk reaction. Lift up their head to get that last breath in. But here, Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, that's interesting, because I think it just underscores the fact that Jesus was in control. Isn't that an amazing Savior of ours, amen? Hallelujah. But he committed himself into the Father's hands. <clears throat> and that's exactly what you and I need to do in tough times. We need to pray for what we think will bring the Heavenly Father the most honor, the most glory. But we also need to pray, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine be done. As a son or daughter of God, you haven't cashed in yet. Your big paycheck is coming in heaven. And it depends on the things you do on earth. That's why the Bible teaches, live by faith. Live by faith. Do things for God. Live by faith. Serve him by faith. When you get to heaven, your reward will be great. Even the Lord Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Anyhow, he gets down there in verse, I think, 12, chapter 5 of Matthew, and he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And Jesus ought to know. So when you're getting persecuted for your faith, don't turn and say, Ah, oh, well, what about you? Yeah, you're a dirty, rotten pirate. Ah, you're not even saved. You know, don't, don't do that. But return good for their evil and rejoice in your heart and saying, praise God, I'm going to get a paycheck in heaven. Hallelujah. In Hebrews, great hall of faith, chapter 11, it talks about certain believers who chose death, chose martyrdom, knowing that they'd get a far better resurrection. It's that same concept, that same idea of a paycheck in heaven. And that's what you and I ought to do, is live our lives here on earth for when we get home to heaven. You see, we are sons and daughters of God, very true. Kings and queens, very true. Bible teaches that in the book of Revelation. But we're not there yet. We haven't been crowned yet. We're on earth. And so even though we're a son or daughter of God, here on earth, we take a servant status. We're a servant until our coronation day. Now, some Christians don't want that. They want the crown now. Say, I want the glory now. I want it all now. They get the order reversed. Before honor is humility. That's God's plan. He teaches that in the Bible. If we do not live a, a humble life here on earth, a life of service, we're not going to get the, the crown. We're not going to get the glory. It's, it's like we'll be paupers in heaven. You'll still get to heaven but you'll be stinking poor as opposed to being glorified and, you know, rich and ticker tape parade and great and wonderful things. You say, well, I'm not really into that sort of thing. Yeah, God is. God wants to reward his children. Just like any parent would love to reward his son or daughter. Son, listen, do good in school. And man, we're going to have a party when graduation comes. Oh boy, I'm going to do this for you and that for you. We're going to have a great time. We're going to do this together. Just do great in school. Just help me out here, son. Do your best. Get A's. I know you can do it. Do a great job in school. And so the son looks around at his buddies, his beer drinking buddies, and his video game buddies. By the way, there's nothing wrong with video. There's a lot wrong with beer. But it's my opinion. And so uh, he says, well, you know, uh, I got four years left here in this college. Uh, I'm going to have a little fun. And so he starts to hoop it up and his grades take a nosedive. How does his dad feel? How does his mom feel? You see, finally, he, he gets to graduation day and he graduates with a C. And then he comes and says, okay, where are these great things you're going to do for me? Sorry, I'm sorry, son. You traded it. Like the prodigal, 
You traded it all. You squandered it away. Let's never take the eternal and sacrifice it on the altar of the immediate. Let's never do that. Amen? Boy, there's a coronation day coming for every one of us if we'll live our lives for him. So how you live your life down here is very important. Live it for the Lord. Live it as a servant. Don't be afraid to live by faith. Do the right thing. Take the humble road. If you're persecuted, accept it. And say, hallelujah, I'm going to have a greater, a greater time in heaven because of it. So we come to these final words. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave up the ghost. And then he died. That was Friday. Friday was pretty gloomy. Someone wrote to me and told me of uh, words of a preacher talking about how gloomy that Friday was, how despondent, despair, and how dark it was when Jesus died. But then he said, folks, Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. And it came. And he rose from the grave. And there's great hallelujahs because of it. And you and I here on this earth are often going through that darkness of Friday where things aren't going the way we want them to. The money's not coming in. We're not seeing the great things happen that we wish we could. And we're discouraged. Folks, Sunday's coming. He's going to come for us one day and he's going to call us to himself. And we'll be caught up together with him. And it'll happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, when the dead in Christ are raised. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Sunday's coming. Let's look to him.